Good afternoon, everyone. Well done for making it this far. Uh, and thank you for delaying your lunch uh, to come to this session. My name's Chris Curtis. I'm the editor of Broadcast. And it's my pleasure to be discussing a new era of BBC Two with its recently appointed channel editor, Patrick Holland. Uh, but it won't just be me asking the questions. We've got some uh, strategically placed uh, questions from the video wall, which I'm sure you will have seen by now, earlier sessions. Um, and there's also a chance for you guys in the audience to submit questions uh, via the festival app. Frankly, if you haven't downloaded it by now, you're probably not going to, but please, uh, lots of opportunity there, and uh, we'd love to have you guys involved. We will, unlike some other sessions, also have some uh, incredibly old-fashioned but very effective roving microphones. So the other way that you can ask a question is to put your hand in the air, uh, wave it around, and uh, all being well, we will come to you. So please do take that opportunity. Um, in my notes, uh, rather ominously, uh, Patrick, the first section in my notes says, who is Patrick Holland? Um, so rather than ask you to recount your biography or tell us your inside leg measurement, uh, I thought we'd start with uh, more immediate stuff. Um, you moved from the indie sector, from um, significant jobs with Ricochet and Boundless, to the BBC, into Docs, into the BBC Two job. Do you think that your, your, the fact that you've recently come out of the indie sector will inform the way that you, that you does inform the way that you work and will, will inform the way that you, you run BBC Two? I think that um, as someone who's used, used to sitting over there rather than sitting here, um, that I've got a, a rich understanding of the indie sector, the great possibilities that are involved in, um, in programme development, um, the frustrations that can come from um, programme development and, and the uh, uh, relationship with, with channels. But also, I've got a brilliant awareness of uh, what happens when you have a terrific relationship with mm -hmm. a, a, a genre commissioner and with, a, and with channel controllers. So I know how um, I used to, you know, the, 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 the experiences that were brilliant for me when I was in th those seats mm -hmm. in terms of uh, that c collaboration with really um, encouraging thoughtful genre controllers and uh, channel controllers who then were enabling people to, to tell their stories. So I think that having seen it from that side, I think it's help, helping me in terms of mm -hmm. defining mm -hmm. how I will run things from this side. Very good. Were there particular, maybe some specifics, were there particular commissioners or controllers that you particularly enjoyed pitching to, or have you, are there lessons that you've learned from that? What, you know, what, 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 how would you characterise a, a good relationship between a, a producer and, 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 a, and a commissioner or controller? The, uh, it's, I, maybe it's because it was when I was a producer director, series producer, um, but when I um, worked in the indie sector at uh, uh, RDF many, many years ago, I, um, the, the relationship that we had with Peter Dale at Channel 4 was extraordinary. And Peter, in terms of someone who, at that stage in my career, who had such a, um, a rich portfolio of ideas, all the way from the government inspector through to Wife Swap, you know, Peter Kosminski through to, you know, a show that was getting sort of 8 million viewers for Wife Swap, um, that he enabled an extraordinary team of people. He um, enthused the indie sector. He got the best people to make the best shows, and I, at the time, thought everyone was like that. So I thought that that was, you know, the way that um, television was run. And I don't claim to have be anything like Peter Dale, but I think that that's the type of spirit that I've tried to bring to the docs job in the last year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, open door policy, engaging with people, uh, really being fired up by ideas, and not having that sense of there was always the thing that I found very frustrating in the indie sector, which was where you're chasing slots and you're chasing specific parts of a schedule. And there's that sort of sense of it disempowers everyone along the creative process. Because what happens is that the channel controller says that they want a five-part series about X. The genre controller says, OK, let's go and tell three or four different indies about this five-part series about X. Everyone gets told about it. And then all you get is what you put in at the other end. You know, that, that is absolutely, it sort of it can close down creativity. Mm -hmm. So for me, that sense of engaging with people, what's your best idea? What's your most exciting idea? What's the idea that you really, really want to make? Um, that's what we've been trying to do in the last year in docs. And that's 
what I hope that we'll be able, be able to carry on doing um, across the channel. And, and how hands-on or hands-off do you see yourself being in the sense that you were re recently ahead of a genre and that's absolutely at the front line of that, you know, indie meetings. You're now um, running the channel. Do you see yourself, um, you, you know, having that kind of regular same kind of contact with, with indies or, or do you, is it best for people to work through the genre and then the ideas will come up to you that way? I think it's really important that the genres are the, are the, are the, um, the specialists who have got that one-to-one -one relationship with the particular suppliers. Um, so in terms of comedy suppliers talking to Shane, drama suppliers talking to um, Lucy or um, Piers when he um, starts. So the, but at the same time, I, um, you know, as, a, as, a, as the head of docs, I empowered my commissioners to have that same, they were driving the relationships with the Indies. They were the ones who, in terms of the day-to-day, -day, but in terms of engaging with the bigger picture, in terms of bringing, um, I mean, we're gonna share a taste of tape from um, Minnow in a minute, um, but in terms of those conversations with Colin Barr and, and, um, and the team at Minnow, that I would be having those conversations with Colin, but I'd also, but with the, the commissioning team, uh, mm. you know, within my department, so that there's an understanding that there's a real, um, it's going to fly, their ideas are going to fly if I embrace their ideas, champion their ideas, and try and work out what's the best way of, 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 of making that idea come to life. So, yes, my door will be open, yes, I want, to, I want to be meeting Indies, I want to be talking to them, but I'm not going to be, I'll be doing that with genre controllers, I won't yep. be doing it behind their backs or disempowering them. Fantastic. Uh, you mentioned that taster. Let's let's uh, let's uh, show our clip here. This was a, a clip selected to um, to illustrate um, something that Patrick thinks of as a as a really effective taster tape. So uh, you know, access to police, access to justice systems, a relatively well trodden path. What was it about that tape that, that caught your attention? The thing about the um, so Mino came to us and uh, over a year ago and said um, that in the year of the presidential election. And that was before Trump, it was before um, you know, the, all of the horrific um, uh, escalation of violence um, in certain communities over the last um, year. That, um, that what about a series that engages, these were the people who came up with the detectives, mm. um, what about a series that brings that same forensic storytelling quality to um, the, the system of justice within a, a particular county in, in um, Florida? And I mean, Minnow are amazing suppliers. You don't have to question their sort of editorial judgment. You're not questioning their creativity. But the one thing that why, and that was, I mean, it's a very small um, yeah. section of a very long, it's a very long taste to tape, that one. It's almost like a film in its own right. Um, but, it, um, but what we wanted to do was try and find out that, is there a connection between the different elements that they were saying? There was a concern, a question that we had, which was, is, um, access to the police in Miami and access to the courts and access to the prisons, is that going to just be a profile or is there a narrative that goes between those three mm. things? Is there a way of bringing those different stories together that means that it will, it will stand out as drama and have a level of engagement to the audience where you just think character and drama first and then issues second because I think that that's the way that it would speak to the biggest, broadest audience. And um, so. Uh, Minnow filmed the, um, we gave them some significant development money to, to test that out, to try and work out whether that was the case. And the tape that came back, and obviously it's a very small section, but did, in a very filmic way, powerfully argue that these three different separate, these separate elements. Um, and what's really exciting about it is that now, you know, Colin's obviously, Colin Barr is going to, um, is executive producing. But two, you know, one thing that I want to talk about is about the, the place of authorship and the place mm. of sort of the director's voice on BBC Two. And with that series, that um, two, I mean, they're not junior, but two people who aren't right, you know, the, the, in the, the, with 20 years of experience as documentary makers, they're people who have got three or four films under their belt, but with Johnny Taylor um, and Arthur Carey, there's two young, exciting directors who are taking on a really meaty subject. And I think that that is, it's, and it feels now, I'm really pleased we commissioned it. It feels really, really timely. It's really exciting that it's coming down the line. And, um, and the stories that are coming back from Florida at the moment are uh, breathtaking in the, um, in the access. Fantastic, we'll, we'll talk uh, about authored pieces um, slightly later on in the session. Before we talk programming strategy, I wanted to discuss with you um, working relationships. 
and in particular um, your working relationship with Charlotte Moore because the, there's been a restructure um, the job that you have is slightly different to the job of the, your predecessors uh, in the sense that you're a channel editor rather than a channel controller and you're, and you're, and you're feeding in to, and reporting in to, to, to Charlotte. Can you characterise for us how that's going to work? She, she has sort of set the broad strategy and you're now, your job is to interpret that. I think it's, yes, that the, there is a new, it is a new um, structure at the BBC and the, the way that we're going to be working is that, you know, the old structure was set in place 20, 30 years ago mm -hmm. when, you know, in a pre-multi-channel world and where it, the different channels could operate quite sort of in isolation from each other. And they didn't have to s sort of like uh, work out what was the way that the BBC best served the audiences across the piece, across the, what's the, what's the way that for the broadest audience, um, and that's our, you know, that's our duty to, 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 to um, create content for, for everyone, some con that the um, that what we need to do is is move on from a structure where BBC One and BBC Two um, and the other channels are, are operating, you know, in, in, with some distance from each other. So the new structure is that I run BBC um, Two, that Charlotte has set out a strategy across all of the um, channels, mm -hmm. and that that my strategy, you know, my job is to build on that strategy, to, um, to interpret um, what, she's, you know, what she's laid out in terms of the place of authorship on the channel, but to build on that and build on that framework and to take BBC forward. So I wonder, you know, a, a question that several people have asked me, I wonder how much autonomy you will have. So, for example, if you decided you wanted to give a particular part of the schedule an identity, you wanted to have a, um, you know, Thursdays is going to be comedy night, or you wanted to up the ante on a certain genre, would you take that, that idea to Charlotte and she would kind of say, yeah, you know, that, that, you, you, would, you would discuss that with her and, and, and plough ahead with her? I mean, I'm running BBC Two with the BBC Two team, and that the, in terms of the commissioning of programmes for BBC Two, that's me and the team that are going to be commissioning programmes for BBC Two, crucially with all the genre um, mm -hmm. com commissioners. Mm -hmm. So, and so there, in terms of everyone sort of asking, are there going to be three ticks? And the answer is no, there's two ticks. There's a tick from the genre commissioner, there's a tick from me. And so, and that is the way that we'll proceed. In terms of the really big strategic decisions, in terms of thinking, you know, should we commission uh, this massive series from um, Tom Rob Smith, Mother, Father, Son, you know, which is is an extraordinary thriller that mm -hmm. is that is going to be coming to BBC Two. Um, of course, I would talk to Charlotte about it. I mean, it's millions and millions of pounds. It's a huge, huge investment. And also, I think that, you know. I'm new to running a channel, so I'll be going to Charlotte and asking her advice on things. But Charlotte hasn't got a tick. We're running BBC Two. So let me push you on that a little bit. So is it, is it fair to say then that in the nicest possible way, um, maybe shorter runs or um, uh, shows which are more in your factual heartland, that, 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 that you know, Charlotte's no involvement, the, 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 thing, the thing can be greenlit without Charlotte's involvement, but a bigger project, a more expensive thing, maybe something in comedy or drama. Th th she will have a, a, an element of uh, oversight and, and um, would potentially have the ability to say, yes, let's go for it, or hang on, are we really sure about this? I think the, th the difference is that, that, that she'll be across all of the channels. I mean, mm -hmm. she's the director of content, so she's going to be across all of the channels and everything that everyone's commissioning. So the, of course you're going to go to the director, you know, you're going to go to your director of content and say, I'm doing this. Um, but is Charlotte going to be, there's not going to be two tiers, it's not going to be above a certain spend then suddenly I go to Charlotte. In terms of uh, how we commission, I will be, you know, I'll talk to Charlotte about the strategy across the different mm -hmm. genres. I'll talk to her about the, you know, what we're doing with seasons, about working with other BBC um, channels with seasons. I mean, I think the crucial difference about the new system is that it's one portfolio. We're trying to find the best way to bring the great content across the BBC channels to the audience. And so if that means that, you know, with something like the um, uh, Black British season that's coming up, that, that, you know, we want to make sure that, yes, it's home is on BBC Two, but we want to try and think about, you know, what other parts of the, um, of the portfolio can help augment that. So, finally, this, you are super confident that there will not be any sort of sense of a commissioning logjam 
as a result of, a, 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 of this new structure. There's no, there's no um, reason that that should uh, be the case. No, far from it. I think we're completely the opposite. I think that what will happen is that BBC Two, in, with you know, that now that you know there has been a sort of a, a period before my appointment, but so but BBC Two has got. You know, I'm the leader of BBC Two. Got clear um, ideas about what we'll have, what we're going to do in terms of taking um, the channel forward, and that the, for you know for suppliers, if I was sitting on the um, on those benches, then I'd feel that there's there's you know it's a period where we can really move forward, and there's going to be much greater clarity and much greater speed. Excellent. Um, time now for our first question from the video wall. Uh, this is Mick McAvoy who's head of docs at STV. Hi Patrick, is there space for taking risks on BBC Two and what kind of risks would you like to take? So, a fresh opportunity here, I mean, a risk could be, could be scheduling, could be controversial topics, could be spending a bit of money on certain, in certain places, what, what kind of risk taking would you like to see? I think that... Um, I think risk, risk taking is absolutely uh, uh, central to to BBC Two's DNA across the different um, uh, uh, the different genres. That if I think about, you know, what's what are the um, qualities that define BBC Two? You know, what's the BBC Two at its best is a channel that is should be the most creative channel on television. That is something that celebrates authorship and puts the author at the, big, at the front of, of, of the production process in terms of getting those best ideas and seeing you know, great people making their best work. I think that the other thing that I would characterise is that, that BBC Two at its best is that it's the most confident, you know, it needs to be a really confident channel mm -hmm. and it's a confident when it commissions big pieces like Exodus that take on huge subject matters um, that was a massive risky undertaking. I think we're going to talk about it later but um, in more detail. But the risk involved with something like that is absolutely crucial. And we're recent, we're re re recently announced a big piece um, that Simon Dixon and, and um, Lorraine Chark were doing at Label One for us, which is, is a massive risk taking um, for us. It's a six part series um, about the crisis in the NHS to hold through one hospital, but crucially, it would be the dramas of what happens in that hospital uh, over a week and the knock-on effect of one person coming in um, as a road traffic accident, meaning that someone else gets pushed out of their bariatric surgery. Um, that was a very good toast to take, by the way, that um, Simon did for that. But, the, um, but so that's a BBC Two risk-taking big project for our six-part series mm. that, um, that it, you know, it's, it's, it's trying to... Uh, force the drama, no, not force the drama, but put framework, a framework around the drama like that and have the, that, that everyday drama that speaks to some bigger issues, that speaks to, um, I think, is, is a really risk-taking proposition. Okay. So, so risk-taking is at the heart of... Um, Lots of, what of appetite for creative ambition. For Absolutely. Okay, that's Absolutely. A, that's a, so let's talk programming strategy, then we'll get to the, we'll get to the heart of it. Um, Charlotte's been very clear on uh, BBC Two a couple of times. She's spoken publicly about it. She wants a BBC Two which is more distinctive from BBC One and from everything else out there. Uh, she wants a much greater sense of identity. She wants to give a voice to new perspectives and opinions, which all sounds to me like a uh, fantastic but quite a daunting challenge. Now, I know that Walter Wall are very uh, excited about that show as well, um, but uh, Devil's Advocate, immersive history format, we've seen those before. Mm. So tell us. So what is, um, I'm so excited about by, by um, this show is that it is an immersive history format, but the thing that feels that I understand and get into the nitty gritty of what life was like in the Victorian slum um, is because of the thought that they've put into the interconnectedness of the story. So the slum operates as a living, working um, organisation of people. They've built a slum, right? They've, they've recreated a slum, they've, right? so, so they've taken over a, a, a building in Stratford, um, that, that has been painstakingly taken back to a horrific time, um, that families have moved in and that, the, um, th that there's someone who's running the DOS house, there's someone who's running the shop, and what it happens is means that there's a community, you can only buy food from the shop if, your work, if the work that you've done has meant that you've um, been able to earn enough money. And that sounds a bit you know, sort of challenging, but I think that what happens as, it, as the stories unfold is that you don't just 
um, get told by some academic about what the what life was like for a um, poor person in Victorian London, you live that and you experience it. And the challenges of, of working out whether to spend your money on your bed for the night or to spend your money on some food, which was a very real um, decision for people, you know, 100, 150 years ago, uh, is felt by the um, people who are in the in the slum. So I think it's it asks lots and lots of um, questions. It's again back to the sort of risk taking. It's a very big ambitious show, and um, and I think it's 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 going to be really um, uh, thought provoking for the audience. Okay. Um, you're after distinctive voices, you're after authored programming, you're after factual specialisms. Is this really about BBC Two? You're after programmes that have a real point of view. You want, you want something with a, with a specific take on, on, on topics? I think a specific take rather than a sort of general overview is really important. I think that sort of that there's that sense of of what excites me when I look at the, um, at the slate of programmes coming through. And it's where you've got that distinctive voice, where you think that you're going to find out about the world in a way that is surprising or, or challenging. That, that, and it, but not necessarily that it feels like homework. It doesn't mean to say that just because it, we're, we're, we're setting the bar high in terms of purpose and setting the bar high in terms of being really willing to take on complexity means that, I mean, Victorian slum means that you, I've retained insights from Victorian slum in terms of I know what sleep, I could sleep on a clothesline meant and, it's, and it means you could literally sleep on a, you know, that was the worst bit of the DOS house. If you could afford anything else, you literally flopped over a, a piece of string. Um, that there are de there's detail that comes from really imaginative ways of, of exploring subject matter. So the bar is really high in terms of we're not afraid to take on complexity. An Hour to Save a Life is, I think, a really, um, uh, you know, is a, f is a series that takes on the complexities of medical decision making, but through a really, you know, it's a really um, taut, dramatic, and challenging, you know, hour. But I think that the, um, so, so yes, purpose is really, really important. But at the same time, it's um, the, the the way that we bring that purpose to the audience and, and get people to experience things and live things um, is really important as well. Okay, good. Factual specialisms mm -hmm. is an interesting phrase. I always thought it was specialist factual, but um, uh, I wonder: are we going to see more science, engineering, history, arts, religion on BBC Two? Well, the um, there are pieces in, uh, I think that the, 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 you know, the issue about with history and with science and with, with arts is about, again, coming back to authorship, that that is the sort of, at the core of each of those genres, there is that uh, a real desire to champion those authored pieces that give us really strong points of view. So David Olasoga's um, uh, forgotten slave owners, that that was you know, an, an amazing BAFTA winning piece of history. We're going to show a clip, I think, of, um, of the new series coming forward. So, and the, so those pieces that, that have got, rather than just giving us a, some, an, an oversight, an mm -hmm. overview, sorry, mm -hmm. is that ability to, to dig deep into subject matters and offer quite um, different points of view. I mean, the new history of um, Black Britain that David's done, um, is going to tell the story of the last four or five hundred years from a very, very different perspective of the Britain's relationship with um, Africa and African peoples. And, and I think that it's not just a, a history which is about uh, the people of Africa. It's a history about all of us, mm. but told from a different perspective. OK. So within those genres, obviously, you're looking for something slightly different. I wonder, just in general, on BBC Two, do you see the genre mix changing? The balance of uh, of different genres, given that there's a, there's a, a, a hit, you know your background and, and and a hint from what what, what Charlotte said about what she'd like BBC Two to do, that we perhaps will see more factual programming um, on, on the channel um, as opposed to some other genres. Is that fair? No, I don't think it's fair at all. I think that factual. I mean, BBC Two is is primarily a factual channel. You know, that if you look at the hours, that the factual is a, is a, is a really important, um, well, it's the most important part of it. But there's absolutely no stepping back from, um, from our commitment to drama and comedy. There's a brilliant comedy that we've just, with two brilliant comedies that um, we've com uh, recently commissioned. One is White Gold by Damon Beasley, who wrote The Inbetweeners, which is a... Um, I've read the first three scripts. It's hilarious. Um, 
uh, takes the audience into 1980s um, Essex and the world of double glazing salesmen. The white gold of the title is the plastic that brought double glazing to the... Um, a, it's a wide boy comedy, is it? It's a wide boy comedy, but with really brilliant um, uh, characters that um, it's a bit sort of um, Glenn, Glary, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, but transposed to... Always um, be closing, Patrick. Always be closing, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, so, um, and then there's actually the first commission um, that was announced yesterday that, um, that I made is the uh, Kevin Bishop, Nigel Farage piece. So it's fast turnaround, um, it's felt like a good, a, a good thing to do at this time and so we'll um, be bringing that to the audience soon. So, you know, comedy, the absolute the commitment there, drama, I talked about um, Tom Rob Smith, Tom Rob Smith who wrote um, uh, uh, London Spy, Spy yeah, yeah. is um, is returning, and there's this thriller which I keep reading scripts and just saying to the drama department, "Can you send me the next script? I need to see the next script." This is, I mean, it's it takes you into the world um, of the relationship between media and power, um, and it's a brilliant um, thriller. So, this, uh, and then. Uh, finally, The Luminaries, which has won the Booker Prize, mm. one of my favourite novels in the last few years. Um, Eleanor Catton, who's the Booker Prize, youngest winner, uh, ever winner of the Booker Prize, um, has recrafted the novel into this epic love story um, set in New Zealand. And so that is a huge drama for us um, and something that I'm meeting Eleanor uh, sometime before Christmas. And I think it's the thing that I'm most meeting I'm most excited about. Brilliant. That sounds good. We'll, we'll pick up on some of those um, slightly later when we talk about John Lewis. Um, I'm going to go to our next question uh, from the video wall now, and a fairly key fundamental question. Hi, Patrick. Welcome to the job. Who is a BBC Two viewer going forward? Who is a BBC Two viewer going forward, or indeed just staying still? <laughs> I mean, I think BBC Two is, as I've said before, is a, is, a, is a channel that is not afraid of taking on uh, the big subjects of the world. It doesn't shy away from the complexity mm -hmm. of the world. But it's also a channel that has a real um, vibrancy of tone. If you think about the different, um, you know, if you think about a brilliant VT from Top Gear, or if you think about Pottery Throwdown, or you think about Robot Wars, or you think about um, uh, Upstart Crow, it's all fizzing with ideas. There's a real sort of like sense of excitement about the world and questioning the world, and and it's clever, but it's not a, it's not smart. You know, it's not it's, not, it's I'm sorry, not, I was always going to say smart ass, but then I suddenly said, but it's um, but it's it's a, it's a it's a channel that people that I think the audience comes to because it's um, it, it, it celebrates that complexity um, and interprets that complexity for the audience. And, um, and celebrate specialism. It's about details. Celebrate. So I think that the BBC Two viewer is um, is from across the whole um, range of ages, across the whole um, diversity of, um, of of different groups. So um, that's that's not sort of like um, saying everyone. It's saying you know BBC Two. The BBC Two audience loves that specialism, mm. and I think that's why that's who the BBC Two audience is. I'm interested. Um, there's clearly a drive. Um, for BBC One and BBC Two to be more clearly delineated, um, given that BBC One is very big and very broad and very mainstream, um, I wonder is there is there a danger that all the sort of populist fun is on BBC One and BBC Two in this in, in this in this new phase is asked to be a bit sort of dry and dusty? Not at all. I think that if you think, I mean. Robot Wars, I think, was a great success. We're in discussion with them about, you know, another series, series going forward, which I'd love to do. Um, the, uh, we've just commissioned a series from 2-4, who did Marigold Hotel, which is called mm. Last Chance Summer. Last Chance Summer sees a group of people who, sorry, not Last Chance Summer. <laughs> it was uh, something else. It's called a Second Chance Summer. It's just, um, um, so Second Chance Summer, it's not their last chance, it's their second <laughs> chance. Um, the second chance um, is so people who are in the middle of their lives, who are wondering what to do, who sort of like might have been out of a relationship or, you know, sort of like in a career change, that I think that lots of people um, might be aware of people in that situation. And um, so what happens is a group uh, go together. You could never go and buy a, um, a, a farm in 
Tuscany or in somewhere in Italy on your own. So you do it together. It's a six-part series that sees that group of people come together, bring in the harvest, and try and work out whether that's a business that they can sustain and do themselves going forward. So again, it's a big, ambitious series. It's, uh, I think it's a really f- going to be a really fun um, watch for the audience and really engage with so I think quite a lot. It, of it follows the same project through the series, does it? Absolutely. So, so it's, a, you know, it's a big experiment. It's a big six-part experience where that group of people, we will follow them um, over the, you know, follow their story um, in Italy over that, that period of time. So that's a great factual entertainment show with real purpose, BBC Two values all the way through it. Um, and, um, and so, no, that's not a dusty old, you know, sort of uh, academic piece. The, um, there's been quite a lot of talk at the festival um, about younger viewers. Um, and uh, I wonder how important is it for you? How much of a priority is it for you to attract younger viewers or to try and maybe potentially drive down that, that, the, the, the average age figures which are kind of doing the rounds at the festival? So again, I think BBC, it's not BBC Two, Two's job to chase young viewers. It's not, you're not going to suddenly have a whole slate of programming that's only targeted specifically at 16 to 34s. What um, BBC Two's role is to, as I've said, um, explore the world, uh, bring that complexity, bring the specialism of the world to the audience. I mean, it's extraordinary when you think that, um, well, it's not extraordinary, Louis Theroux's Drinking for Oblivion, mm-hmm. massively, massively watched by um, young viewers. And um, I mean, pieces like Robot Wars, as, as, a, as that specialist factual at the heart of it, it feels like, you know, the format has caught up with the technology. And so, you know, bringing it back now, it's, it's bigger and brighter than ever. It speaks to the whole family. So that's a slightly different sort of age group. I think that what we need to keep doing is, is encouraging producers to think about those great stories that they want telling, think about great ways of telling those stories. Um, that speak to the broadest audience. Um, but at the same time, we want to feel contemporary. We don't want to feel, you know, that, so that means, I think American justice could speak to a, to a um, broader audience. Mm. Obama's White House, Norma Pierce's bit, that spoke to a really broad, a very diverse audience in terms of age and, and diversity. So it's, I don't think you go chasing these things. I think that what you do is you're contemporary by reflecting the world. Yeah, breadth. You're, you're interested in breadth of Absolutely. audience, really, and, and, and touching mm. as many different types of people as you can. Mm. OK. Um, there's a lot of uh, talk at the BBC about distinctiveness mm. at the moment. It's not an easy term uh, to define. So do you want to have a bash at doing just that? What does, what does, uh, what does distinctiveness mean to you? And, and when... So I'm interested in distinctiveness. Uh, genuinely, honestly, when you're, you know, you're at the point of thinking about commissioning a show, do you and your, your genre commissioners hold that up and think now is you know really genuinely is this a distinctive piece of content i think if you're not excited by the idea and you're not excited by the way that that idea is going to be executed then you don't commission it and and if you feel that you're only doing that because someone else is doing it then you don't commission it the um the 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 number of ideas that come in the number of discussions that you have about an idea are sort of um, you know you could um, many and multitudinous and it's you know, it's really important that when, and I, so, so it's only those ideas that really excite that are ever going to get through. And so, yes, distinctiveness is, you know, I, but I, again, I think that the, the, sub, the titles that we we're talking about today with, you know, I think that, you know, White Gold from comedy, Upstart Crow was really distinctive. I mean, that was familiar, it was Ben Elton. It was Ben Elton at his absolute, you know, back to his best. And a very, very distinctive, you know, who would think that you'd get, um, all those viewers for a comedy show about um, a sort of inarticulate Shakespeare. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's an extraordinary, yes, distinctiveness is there, but everything that I've been talking about in terms of authorship, everything that I've been talking about in terms of that sort of creative ambition and risk taking is all at the heart of that distinctiveness. So let's, let's stick on comedy for a little while. We'll talk it th- through some of the, the, the genres completely see what you say about white gold and I can, I can accept that. When I think about, if, if you ask me about BBC authored comedy uh, with, a, with a sort of central voice in it, I might think about things like Miranda or Mrs Brown's Boys or Citizen Khan. Um, certainly Mrs Brown's Boys, Citizen Khan, big mainstream BBC One pieces. So I wonder, you know, there, there's, there's uh, some interesting nuance there as opposed to what, a, what a, an authored voice piece for BBC Two is as distinct from, from BBC One in comedy? Well, I think that it's, um, 
I mean, Inside Number Nine is a distinctive um, authored piece of comedy. Mum is an, you know, one of my favourite shows from, from the last six months because of the beauty of the writing and just Leslie um, Manville as the, as the lead just uh, brilliantly brought that um, character to life. So those, those um, series feel you know, quintessentially BBC Two. Mm -hmm. they, they really, um, they're celebrating nuanced details, specificity of experience, um, beautifully honed characters, and um, and on two, on one, you know, your bigger, bolder, you know, sort of mm -hmm. like more mainstream. Mm -hmm. So that's what, how I'd see the distinction. Those two pieces you picked out, there are slightly off kilter pieces, aren't they? Inside Number Nine is, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, compendium uh, a piece, very mm. different styles. Mum um, is not a not a gag a minute. Uh, I find it funny. I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not suggesting it isn't funny. Uh, uh, is White Gold uh, uh, you know, a more traditional scripted comedy? I mean, it takes you into a very, very specific time and place, as I've said, and so that feels very, very BBC too. And it's also, um, it's, it's, you know, Damon Beasley as the uh, um, author that who is, you know, being given free reign to, to really, you know, mine that um, to seem. So, uh, that feels very, very BBC too. Can we talk a little bit about entertainment on BBC Two, which is obviously given, you know, it, it, it's a genre where it can have great, great success. It's not an easy, you know, if you're talking about distinctiveness and you're talking about um, uh, authored voices, not an obvious um, uh, a genre where it's easy to, to do that. 10 p.m. is quite an interesting slot for you guys. There are some sort of pilots knocking around and, and, and desire perhaps for a bit of innovation at, at 10 p.m. I mean, it's early days for me in terms of getting my head around the, um, the new entertainment um, ideas coming through, but we are talking to um, Alan and then Kate when she um, starts in terms of what we're going to be doing um, across the piece, it's not just at 10. Um, but entertainment's got a really important role on BBC Two. As I've been you know, banging on about um, Robot Wars, Dragon's Den has come back and has been, you know, it's been, it feels like it's really, you know, sort of firing on all, all cylinders. Really loved by a broad audience, really loved by a diverse audience. Um, so, entertain, and, you know, and Top Gear as well. You know, Top Gear is part of that entertainment um, uh, uh, story on BBC Two and very central to it. Common Sense is quite an interesting commission an attempt to put uh, this is a, a new one for, perhaps you can talk a bit about this attempt to put some satire into the schedule is that say is satire a fair description yeah what well, yeah but, i mean so common sense is actually from it's a comedy commission um real people talking about events in the news but um with sort of with with filmed in everyday life so it's sort of you're getting stories from across britain but people doing uh People in very close relationships with people they work with, people that they um, that they uh, socialise with, people in their you know people from all different walks of life, and that what it is is a way of doing something fast turnaround, which talks about the their stories of the week and their um, um, goings on of the week, but also talks about the news. So you know Brexit would have washed through that. Um, you know, different issues would have washed through that in terms of it feeling like a... Um, but it's being done through comedy, so it's a really interesting coming together of, um, of you know, Shane and his comedy um, expertise and then uh, the documentary-making skills at Studio Lambert. Very good. Let's uh, move to the video wall. Um, we'll stay in the, broadly the same sort of uh, genre space. And we've got a question now uh, from the video wall from Danielle Lux. Hi Patrick, BBC Two has had huge success in comedy and entertainment, so much so that we often hear there's no room for new comedy ent shows. Are you planning to make some more space for successful shows? Danielle saying, uh, any chance of me getting a commission? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think one of the things about um, BBC Two is that we don't get enough Factual entertainment uh, uh, pitch to us. I think right. that people feel that the um, you know, and in terms of uh, you know, sitting again in your um, seats and thinking, what what should I bring to BBC Two? I think ambitious factual entertainment, whether that's through the entertainment department or whether it's through um, one of the factual um, uh, subgenres, that 
you know, as I say, second chance summer when it came in. I mean, that is it's a particular type of, of factual entertainment. Um, I went and, you know, we, we discussed it first off as a sort of smaller series. And actually, the more we thought about it, we thought, this could, this could really play out. This has got real sort mm -hmm. of um, uh, story to it, and it could really change people's lives. And so we actually went back to 2-4 and said, could you do six? So there is space. You know, we can make space for the right idea. There is no sort of limit on saying, no, our quota's full. We no longer want anything in that area. Um, but... Um, so absolutely, I think that, you know, and I'm talking to, we'll be talking to Kate and talking to Alan at the moment about what, you know, with specifically within entertainment, yeah. what's the way of bringing some fresh ideas to the entertainment? Um, and do you like world? that um, slightly sort of constructed, uh, you know, it's a bit like Real Marigold mm. um, and 2-4, obviously, the same, mm. the, the same company, where they're doing something, and it, 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 you know, it, 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 it's obviously, it's real, but they've, they've made that happen and pushed it with a bit, mm. of, a bit of scale. That, that sort of appeals. I think that what you always need on 2 is a central um, question about why and of the central complexity that you're trying to explore, the central series of, of, um, of, of, of what the purpose of it is. Dragon's Den... Is you know works on BBC Two because it's the best show on television, which looks at the phenomenon of people trying to start out their own businesses. It's very, very. It's got very specific detail in it. It's got terrific drama, and it keeps work. You know, it's 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 no accident that it's been the success that it has on Two, and it's very much a BBC Two show. So I think that the idea, what's important, um, is to always for Two is think about why you're doing it. What's it about? Why are you doing it? It's sort of just uh, entertainment that just is for entertainment's sake um, will be for another channel. OK, good stuff. I'm going to rattle through a, th a, through a few things now as um, uh, we move uh, towards the end. An arts block on Saturday nights for BBC Two? I think block is not the right word that I would use. I think it's um, what we're um, uh, working with is, is the idea of, of using Saturday nights as a place to put real arts treats and mm -hmm. to put some other arts programming around it that you know the other the main the big you know BBC One ITV go all out for um, entertainment, and so you know I don't know if you saw the Roald Dahl film it was absolutely lovely the um, uh, Julian Temple film about um, Keith Richards I thought was a, a terrific piece authored piece it did extraordinarily well mm -hmm. I mean not massive numbers but you know it was a really um, well watched and well um, picked up on iPlayer as well so. What we're doing is is using Saturday nights as a way of foregrounding some really really um, distinctive pieces. Again, thinking about author pieces. Mm -hmm. That so we've got a lovely film about Alan Bennett coming up. We've got a film about Sue, Sue Townsend. So it's thinking about those people who speak to a broad audience, yeah. but who. Um, but where there's a real story to tell. Because this is not art as a niche thing. You're not telling me you've got a uh, film about a, a ballerina or a, or a, a, a cellist You're talking about broad, um, broad subjects, but broad, um, broad artists. Absolutely. We want um, people to see BBC Two, and you know, we're trying things out, as, as you say, on Saturday night, um, as a real destination for arts and for a place to uh, celebrate, find out, um, explore... Um, some great stories which um, which resonate about you know art and arts place in our culture. Quickly on on drama, you've got Line of Duty moving to BBC One. They've nicked it off you, um, uh, and, and BBC One's very obviously in drama. Um, uh, they success with big things, Night Manager. They've mm. ordered Troy. Mm. It's where War and Peace sits. Mm. BBC Two drama in a nutshell. How does it relate to the, that that sort of epic scale on one? I mean, I think that, you know, um, Line of Duty is, that is, you know, started out as an extraordinarily well-crafted, um, authored piece that has built and built and built. And the more, the, you know, the bigger the audience, the more it should move to, um, to BBC One, mm -hmm. because that then creates the space for us on BBC Two mm -hmm. to commission Mother, Father, Son, mm -hmm. the, um, the thriller that Tom Rob Smith's writing. Um, I mean, drama has a really, really important role for us on BBC Two. The difference for us is, it's, again, it's foregrounding authorship. You know, writers can come to BBC Two, we will create the space, and they 
um, can to do their very best work. That's what my ambition is. That's what my ambition is across the different genres, is we create the space, we will support and, and, and um, yes, we'll challenge you, but we'll also support you and we'll also make your idea the very best that it can do. And so in drama, that's as important as it is in, in factual. Okay, uh, nine months ago, uh, you wanted docs with warmth and wit and a bit of mischief, mischief uh, for BBC Two. Is that still the case? Yes, I think it was because we had quite a lot of docs that were <laughs> neither warm nor witty on the slate. So I sort of like it felt like that we were really... detectives or well, yeah, I mean brilliant pieces, and, but at the same yeah, time yeah. there was. Um, so I think that yes, in terms of documentary, I mean warmth and wit is important. We've got this um, a film that two part series that Richard Mace has made, um, Inside Vogue, um, mm -hmm. which um, is coming up shortly on BBC Two, which has got exactly that warmth and wit, but also crucially that sense of inquiry, that sense of purpose um, about um, that, that I think is really important for BBC Two. So, um, so yes, we'd like that. But I mean, also in terms of what my message would be for suppliers is don't, um, don't sort of, uh, because, uh, because BBC Two might have commissioned smaller runs of things before, yep. or because BBC Two has commissioned things that haven't been as ambitious as they might have been, don't let that determine the way that um, you, the ideas that you bring to us. We are in the market for the biggest, the most exciting, the most challenging ideas across the piece. Mm. And I don't think we're going to have time. We're going to have time to talk about Exodus. Well, let's talk about Exodus now. Okay. Well, how does Exodus relate to that then? No, that was, that was, a, that was an interesting, this is an interesting sort of almost format point, really, in terms of how it was, how it was shot and the, giving the cameras to the... Well, I think it was that when it was first pitched, it wasn't, it was a really, really, you know, massive crisis, but it hadn't become the the um, biggest movement of people in you know since the Second World War and the you know biggest crisis facing um, the world um, that it has now the um, imminent crisis that the that the ambition with that was to uh, film people from their points of origin um, or as close to their points of origin as possible and it in terms of ambition in terms of risk and in terms of sort of again creating that space and protecting. Uh, uh, the, the producers to make the very best show that they could, that's what our challenge was. And they filmed in, you know, across 27 continents, uh, sorry, 27, 27 countries, three continents, um, over 12 months, that it's a series that has, um, has a real sense of engaging with the complexity of the world, a series that brought, also brought a real creative vision to it, that the creative vision, you know, that, that uh, James Blumel and the team at, um, ex, at, at, at Keogh um, brought to it was to to unite the individual perspective with that ability to sort of to see that the the the, the scale of the um, of the story, and you know we've we've just spoken to Keo about recommissioning it. We're going to do another series of Exodus. James is doing it, and um, and it's a um, series that I think you know had real power and resonance with the audience. Again, watched by a hugely you know, diverse um, yeah. audience as well. Yeah, interesting. Um, we'll jump now to the next uh, video wall question. Uh, it's a question about BBC Two's highest profile show. Patrick, uh, just between us, now that Danny's gone, do you wish you hadn't sacked Jeremy Clarkson? <laughs> you could reinterpret that question as Top Gear's return didn't go brilliantly. Okay. Question mark. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm a massive fan of Top Gear. I'm not a car. You know, that's one of the things about um, uh, uh, Top Gear is that at its heart, it's a it's another it's a BBC Two show which is about specialism. It's a BBC Two show that gets into the detail and really celebrates um, uh, that specialism. So, in, and in terms of that vibrancy of tone that I was talking about earlier, then you know, Top Gear has got that. Um, so, um, I mean, you know, in terms of Jeremy Clarkson, that's all water under the bridge. I mean, we're not, I'm not going to go there. But in terms of Top Gear, uh, it's going to come back next year. How will it be different when it comes back? Well, it's, I mean, I've been in the job four days, five days, five, six days. Um, the, um, and so I'll be talking to the entertainment team about, you know, what we've learned from that, from the, the last series. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think there are some very good things in it, but I think there's lots of things to learn from it as well. Um, and uh, and then what did you, you know, like best about uh, Top Gear when it when it when it came back? What were the what were the strong elements of it? Do you think? I think I think that it had lots and lots. Of, I mean, I'm not going to go into details because people start pulling it apart and saying, "Well, you know, that's that's what he's going to say." That's that's the reading the runes about how it's going forward. Mm. There's lots of um, there's lots of things that we've, we're taking on board, and then I'll be talking, as I say, Kate starting soon. Um, Alan's in the driving seat at the moment, no pun, and um, and uh, you know, and we'll we'll it will come back in 2017. Do you think it felt a little bit like? to a certain extent, some of the problems were to do with creative responsibility for the show slightly being passed from pillar to post and maybe you might be able to offer it a bit more stability. I don't know what the, um, what the you know, comings and goings were at the, at, of, of behind the scenes at Top Gear at the time. In terms of you know, the way that we will be, you know, that the series will, will come through, it will be just the standard way in which, you know, it won't be different with Top Gear than it is from any other show. The genre commissioners are in, um, in the lead. I will give them the support and encouragement that they need. OK, great. We're going to move to app questions and questions from the audience uh, very, very shortly. Just before we do that, Patrick, is there a, um, for the producers in the room, is there a, can you identify a sort of big opportunity on, on BBC Two? Is there a, a slot or a sub-genre where you think, you know what, that's not quite going how I'd like it to at the moment, and there's a real chance if someone can crack it? Is there, is there something that you would be keen to flag up? I think, um, it's as I said before, the, the biggest thing is, 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 is the limits of ambition. Don't be limited by your, you know, be, be as ambitious as you can be with your ideas. We really are um, interested and excited and open to, to, to hear those. I think the other thing is to think about talent, to think about talent that brings passion. You know, the talent that works on BBC Two is talent that has got a passion about the world, a specialism about the world, who's got the ability to share their specialism, whether that is David in, um, in you know, with, the, his, with his history of, uh, of Black Britain. Um, so that's what I'd really, uh, you know, encourage. Do bring us your, um, the people, their talent, your ex. I mean, we're just announcing a new series, which is um, to mark uh, the the um, anniversary of the partition of um, mm. India and Pakistan. And that's two, you know, two new presenters to, for, to BBC Two coming and walking the length of, um, of the border. It's called the world's most dangerous border between India and, and Pakistan. And are they historians? Or are, what, what, no, so, so one of them is, a, um, is an ex-army um, mm -hmm. ex um, officer of Pakistani heritage, mm -hmm. and, and, um, and the other is a journalist. So they, um, but they're new to BBC Two, mm -hmm. and the thing that um, it's October Films who have brought it to us, and it feels like that is a really important um, moment to mark. It's a really um, breathtaking and quite exciting and scary journey, um, but it's really exciting as well that we've got new, two new talents that really understand um, the background to the um, stories that they're telling. So I'd really encourage you to bring us those talents. Opportunity around fresh talent. Fresh Definitely. Fresh OK, great. I'm going to... Um, if you've got a question you'd like to do from the floor, please do... Uh, put your, uh, your, your hand up and, and wave it to attract my attention. Otherwise, we'll move on with questions um, uh, from the app. We've talked a little bit about Robot Wars, so maybe we will, maybe I will ask you about small, uh, small uh, and or new regional and diverse indies are struggling to find commissioners at the BBC, uh, willing to have conversations with them. Um, what do you suggest? How, what would be your advice to those guys? I think that if, um, if you are um, struggling, and it depends on which of the... Um, you know which genre that you're um, you're working in, but I'd encourage you to go to direct to the, um, the the heads of that genre and say if you can't find the that uh, you know not getting an answer from a particular commissioner. Um, I mean Alison Kirkham, who's here, is um, is her, you know she's got a an, I've been working with her for the last year. She's got that open door policy. She's really really receptive to um, to in, to a smaller indies in terms of those inquiries. So you know do just keep um, badgering us. Okay, good. Um, uh, another uh, quite provocative uh, question. Why isn't all the lovely high-level chat about diversity filtering down to your commissioners? Anyone pitching regularly knows it hasn't. Perhaps you could say, talk a little bit about, you know, BBC Two has previously been accused of being quite a white channel. Mm. Um, what, what's your take on how you might try and uh, improve its reputation there? Well, I think that 
it's an ongoing um, co you know, conversation, it's an ongoing massive issue that we need to reflect the audience on screen. You know, we need to, um, and that when, when projects come in, that we, we do challenge. I'll be challenging at channel level, at genre level, we have been challenging. Um, producers, you know, how are we reflecting the audience? Whether it's, um, you know, a, a judge in a, a baking competition, you know, with, with creme de la creme, um, or whether it's a, um, you know, a presenter. Um, Adi Adepatan was here earlier. He's terrific in the um, the New York series that's on at the moment. So we just we need to be challenged, but also we need to we need to find. Uh, presenters that reflect the diversity of modern Britain. So we want more people to come to us. We can, you know, we will keep challenging you, but you need to keep challenging us as well. OK, that makes sense. Um, how do you see BBC Two uh, fitting between BBC One and BBC Four? We've talked a bit about the relationship with One. Perhaps with BBC Four, that's, a, that's a, 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 an interesting relationship. Previously, it was kind of Two and Four were, were um, uh, more closely mm. uh, uh, aligned in the, in, in the old structure. Uh, how will you be working with Cassian? Well, I mean, I've been working with Cassian all year as the uh, commissioning editor for, for documentary as well, and I know Cassian very well from my time in the indie sector. The, um, so, and in terms of how we will work together, I mean, Cassian was very, very generous the other day because an idea who came across his um, desk that he was very keen on, he suddenly felt that it might be, um, uh, be quite good on BBC Two as well. So uh, he came and gave it me a little gift um, As a which welcome, was very welcome nice. to the new job. Welcome to the new job yeah. from Cassian, which was lovely. Um, so, um, so we, it's about talking. I mean, I think that you know Cassian's vision for you know, that Charlotte's discussed, discussed as well for four is that you know it it is a deep dive. It gets into the ideas. It gets into the ideas behind issues. It's you know it's 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 there's a sort of timeless quality to some of the the the, the films that on on BBC Four in terms of the issues. You know, in terms of the stories. Um, so, whereas on BBC Two, I think that we are responding to the world. We're looking at the, um, the way the world's changing. We're not shying away from the complexities of the world today. And so, but again, the, with the portfolio across the, the, the piece, mm -hmm. for producers, exactly what's happened with this, if you pitch to Cassian and he thinks that it's more of a two piece, he will come to me. And similarly, if you pitch to me and I think that, in fact, it happened, someone the other day sent me something and I sent it to Cassian because it felt that it had a sort of, it was about the, the idea behind an issue rather than about the... Mm -hmm. um, the world today. Mm -hmm. OK, that's interesting to know. There's some uh, uh, movement of, our, of ideas there. We're coming uh, towards the end of the session, so I'm going to ask you very briefly and, uh, one of those um, awkward questions to finish, and I'll ask you to make a sort of grandiose statement. But what, what will BBC Two look like um, after, say, two years of you, of you leading it? What do you hope to have achieved? What might some of the, the changes be? I think it's about building on, as I've said before, it's about building, on, building BBC Two um, to be the most creative channel on British television. And to keep, I mean, I think that it's got extraordinary elements of that at the moment. We need to fight across all of the genres to build that space and to encourage people to bring us their, um, those, those brave ideas, those risky ideas, but also the ideas where we will really champion individual voices. So I want more pieces like that, more distinctive pieces like that. Um, but I also want to retain and build on this vibrancy of tone that I've been talking about. Mm. I want it to feel like it's a channel that is fizzing with ideas, which is exciting and excited about the world. Um, and I think that BBC Two has, at its best, has got all of those qualities, but I just think we need to build on them and champion them. Fantastic. Well, uh, I look forward to uh, watching a BBC Two fizzing with ideas over the next uh, uh, couple of years. Um, we have run out of time, ladies and gentlemen, so I need to round up. There's two, uh, two people I need to thank. Uh, apparently, in a slightly weird way, I need to thank Broadcast uh, for sponsoring this session. So, um, well done, me. Um, and uh, more importantly, I need to thank uh, Patrick Holland for his time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.